Thank you, everybody. I'm Paul Glastris. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Washington Monthly Magazine, and uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Barry Lynn at the New America Foundation for partnering with us, and uh, we've uh, done a lot of work together and a lot uh, more to come on this broader issue of industry consolidation and its effects on, on the American uh, culture and political economy. The first half of our program today was uh, focused on the beer and liquor industry uh, and the effects of consolidation on the market. Um, the second half we're going to be talking about the effects of that consolidation on American society and culture. And we've got a great panel to do that. Uh, the, the conversation is going to be built around uh, a terrific piece by, uh, uh, in the current issue of the Washington Monthly. I hope you all pick up a copy uh, either on your way out or you have one uh, by Tim Heffernan, our, our first panelist. Tim is an independent journalist based in New York reporting for The Atlantic, Popular Mechanics, Bloomberg, and others. He's a former editor of Esquire and writes about heavy industry in the natural world. Uh, his current interests include large-scale uh, large metals mining, ultra-massive metals fabrication, and the state of hunting in America. Um, uh, uh, and so, so we'll, be, we'll be discussing Tim's article here today. And uh, uh, part of that discussion, uh, we have three terrific uh, individuals. Jerry Oliver is the former chief of police of Detroit and the former director of the Department of Liquor License and Control in Arizona. He was hired as police chief of the notoriously crime-ridden city of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, but spectacularly, uh, he had a spectacularly success, spectacular success there. Um, uh, the city's uh, uh, homicide rate dropped from 164 homicides in 1994 to 72 in 2000. Um, uh, in his many years of service, Oliver is a uh, served as the assistant chief of police of his hometown of Phoenix, Arizona, the director of drug policy in Memphis, Tennessee, chief of police in three cities, Pasadena, uh, Richmond, and Detroit. And in 1996, Governor, uh, Arizona Governor Janet Napolitano appointed Oliver as director of the Department of Liquor uh, License and Control, which is uh, responsible for nearly 11,000 licenses. Also on our panel, Dr. Thomas Baber, uh, he is head of the Department of Community uh, Medicine and Healthcare at the University of Connecticut School of Me Medicine. Uh, Dr. Baber, is it Baber or Baber? Either one. Oh, either one. Go, good. Uh, good. Dr. Baber spent several years researching at Harvard Medical School, and he served as head of social science research at the McLean Hospital's Alcohol and Drug Abuse Research Center in Belmont, Massachusetts. He uh, has served as the scientific director at the Alcohol Research Center, and he's also regional editor of the uh, international journal Addiction. Finally, we have uh, with us Reverend Cynthia Abrams. Uh, she serves as the program director of alcohol, other addictions, and health care for the United Methodist General Board of Church and Society. Uh, she was born and raised on or near the uh, Chattarugas Reservation, did I Chattaragas. get that? Chattaragas. Chattaragas Reservation of the Seneca Indian Nation uh, in western New York State. She moved to California as an adult and earned a Bachelor of Arts degree at the uh, California State at Long Beach um, uh, and a Master's of Divinity at Claremont School of Theology. From 99 to 2003, she served as the Executive Director of the National United Methodist Native American Center uh, on staff as a layperson at the uh, Native America's Near American UMC of Southern California, she administered the church-sponsored outreach center for American Indian substance abusers in the city of Los Angeles. So we have a wide variety of, of expertise in, in, in the spiritual world and law enforcement and regulation. And, uh, and so we'll begin our discussion, uh, and I'm going to ask Tim to Tell us a little bit about his story, what he found, and uh, what he concluded. Tim? Well, thank you for coming. Um, I should say that I didn't realize I was going to be giving introductory remarks, so these are somewhat off the cuff, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, as Paul said, uh, I'm an independent journalist. I'm based in New York City. Um, 
and I do tend to focus on heavy industry uh, and the natural world. Uh, about two weeks ago, I was down in the bottom of the largest open pit mine in the world <clears throat> in the middle of a snowstorm. So this is a uh, somewhat different venue for, for me. Um, just to describe, I guess, how this story came about, uh, about eight months ago now, nine months ago, um, a friend put me in touch with Barry Lynn here of the New America Foundation, and Barry was looking for someone to uh, research uh, the state of, of consolidation in the American beer industry uh, and how that consolidation um, would really affect society as a whole. Uh, my background is in economics, actually, um, and so uh, I suppose my friend thought I was in a somewhat good position um, to do this sort of research and make the kind of analysis that was necessary. Um, so I got the assignment and got to work. Um, you've heard, I guess, an awful lot of what that research revealed um, in practical terms, in terms of uh, the actual sales uh, and distribution and diversity uh, of beer in this country um, from our earlier panelists. Um, I think that they've covered those issues quite well. Um, you know, it was particularly gratifying for me uh, to have Sam kind of confirm as somebody who actually is uh, in the craft brew industry um, a lot of the concerns that we had about um, the way consolidation will affect um, the, the, uh, the actual diversity and competitiveness within the beer market. Um, but something that, that uh, really is, I think, of even more overarching importance about the research that we did and the conclusions we came to um, is that this is not simply a question of open markets or free markets uh, or of simple kind of economic efficiencies. Um, anytime you <coughs> set up a market of any sort, it involves political questions, it involves moral questions, and it involves questions of the effect that those markets are going to have on society. Um, to the extent that any market is, is regulated or uh, delimited by law, which is to say every single market, to the extent that it's regulated, um, by laws that we pass, it also brings those moral uh, and political issues into play. Um, I suppose one conclusion or one, one thing I would like to point out you know, from that is that the purpose of this article uh, and really I think the purpose of this whole uh, event is not to make an argument for you know, the absolute unregulated free market, nor is it to say that we have to regulate the alcohol market you know, out of existence or so tightly that it's absolutely controlled from the top. Um, it's rather to say that the, uh, the, the sort of moral concerns that went into the construction of the three-tier system uh, when it was put in place back in the 1930s, um, the concerns then were, were very much informed by the recent history of that time. Uh, prior to Prohibition, uh, the United States suffered uh, tremendous amounts of alcohol abuse, uh, and it was... Uh, the alcohol industry operated under a system that was essentially unregulated, and so you had these problems of uh, the tied houses. Um, you had a problem as a result of the tied houses. <coughs> Just to be clear on that, that's essentially a retail outlet for alcohol, uh, which is controlled by the producer of alcohol. Um, these tied houses, because they each only carry the products of one producer, um, if they wanted to be in a given market, they had to have their own outlet there. And so instead of one bar on a corner, you might have four or five bars you know, in a small area. So um, that contributed greatly to the tremendous problems this country had with alcohol at that time. The response was prohibition, which had its own uh, bad consequences, uh, rampant crime, uh, corruption of law enforcement, large black markets, uh, and flatly, it completely failed. So that was the recent history when the repeal laws went through and when the three-tier system was put in place in the 1930s. And it was absolutely an effort to uh, ensure that those conditions, the conditions prior to prohibition, would never come back again, that no individual producers would have so much power, market power and political power, that they could force their products on society to the degree, to the degree that they had. Um, in practical, practical terms, what... Uh, they came up with uh, in, in constructing this three-tier system or what their main concerns were, uh, were to, first of all, ensure that control of alcohol commerce remained uh, at the state and local level so that individual communities could tailor um, the way alcohol was marketed and sold uh, and, and just generally was made available uh, in, their, in their local areas according to local 
concerns, local morals. Um, and then the other one, uh, again, was, was simply to, uh, to ensure that the market was, was <clears throat> separated in such a way that you couldn't have the appearance, as we have today, of one or two companies simply dominating an entire market and drawing market power and political power to themselves to the detriment of the rest of society and even to the detriment of competitiveness in the market. That basically, uh, if that has made sense, uh, is, is sort of the, I suppose, the, the concerns that I hope we can talk about here today. Um, and I'll turn it over to our other guests who can talk more specifically about their own experiences with these moral and social concerns related to alcohol. Um, before we, we, we go to the next slide, I, I did want to uh, ask you, uh, Tim, uh, well, I want to say two things. First of all, as, as Barry said at the beginning of this panel, um, uh, this whole project with Washington Monthly and, and New America is not funded by any industry. Uh, this is a, something we did in-house uh, uh, with our own funds, and, and um, it's important that you all know that and that the audience today uh, uh, on the Internet knows that. Um, second, uh, uh, Tim, I, I, I wonder if you could just say a few words about what was sort of the, uh, you've, d you've described the system that we have now in the United States that is the legacy of, of prohibition. Mm -hmm. um, before we move on, can you say a few words about uh, the nation that you contrast the United States with? Sure. And that is, that is uh, the UK. Yeah. Yes, a, uh, a very good point. Um, so, uh, it's, it's very useful to make a comparison, a historical comparison, between the United States and the United Kingdom uh, regarding uh, the effect uh, or the presence of alcohol in those societies and uh, the way those differ, uh, and then to look at that in the context of the way regulation of alcohol differs. Um, in fact, uh, quite ironically, um, the kind of seminal document that led to the three-tier system toward liquor control, which was produced in, I believe, 1933, um, looked at the United Kingdom at that time as a real model of how to uh, kind of shape the alcohol system in such a way that, that alcohol abuse was not a very great problem. Uh, England had had its own temperance movement because it had its own problems, uh, and England had done a very good job of basically encouraging better behavior, um, <laughs> including uh, milk bars, which are exactly what they sound like. Um, and so by the 1930s, they really were not suffering from tremendous problems with alcohol abuse. Since that time, however, England essentially seems to have fallen asleep on the job uh, when it came to regulating alcohol. Um, and the fundamental difference between them and the United States is that they never made any attempt to regulate the market for alcohol. Such regulations as they had uh, you know, for sale and consumption largely came down to um, ensuring that glasses were all of the right size, the official, the official queen's pint, you know, every glass would be checked, uh, you know, by regulators. Um, similar for shots of alcohol, it has to be a certain small number of milliliters. Um, you know, there were rules, bars might have to close on Sundays, or they might have to close by 11 p.m., or what have you. But in terms of the actual, any rules that towards the way alcohol could be marketed, uh, the, uh, who it could be sold to, how it could be sold, um, really are non-existent there. And we feel that that has contributed very strongly to um, the extreme levels of problem drinking in the United Kingdom. Um, you can buy alcohol there uh, at any hour of the day. Since 1980, the affordability of alcohol in the United Kingdom has dropped, or has, however you want to put it, has risen by about 70%. It is 70% easier uh, to buy alcohol there than it was even 30 years ago. Um, and it should be pointed out that the United Kingdom is now finally recognizing that it has a real problem. Uh, it has spent about 10 years studying the issue, and now every single party in the United Kingdom uh, has on its platform some form of regulation of the market, which includes uh, introducing price controls and efforts to finally break up the tied house system, uh, which they uh, have lived under for a long time. You compare that to the United States over that same period, um, at the beginning, of course, we established this three-tier system, and that was a very fundamental uh, way of um, regulating the market, <coughs> uh, 
such that, uh, again, it was kept uh, to, control of it was kept in local hands, um, and, and no single player was allowed to get uh, sort of undue amount of influence over it. Uh, we feel that that was much more effective than uh, the United Kingdom system, and I think that uh, what's going on in the UK now kind of validates that position. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Tom Babor. <clears throat> I work at the University of Connecticut, and uh, for most of my career as a social psychologist and then with an additional specialization in public health, uh, I've been interested in various aspects of alcohol from a public health perspective. So what I'm going to describe for you today are some observations of about an important uh, perspective that we need to apply to this whole issue of alcohol control, which in part was alluded to uh, by Tim's presentation in the system that was <clears throat> put together following prohibition. Uh, the people who put that system together uh, were acutely aware of the public health and social welfare problems that can be created when alcohol is freely available within a society. And there are, uh, when you look globally at countries and the way they deal with alcohol, you can find tremendous variability both in the types of controls that are used and tremendous variability in the level of problems that uh, are experienced. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, starting in 2003 and then with a revised version of the book in 2010, I and a number of colleagues who came from about nine different countries who had spent most of their lives studying uh, alcohol from different perspectives got together and put together a book called Alcohol, No Ordinary Commodity. The title of the book came from kind of an epiphany of talking about alcohol control policy and the research that had been done. And the fact is that both from the perspective of policymakers who design policies to control alcohol problems, and from an economic perspective, uh, and from a public health perspective, alcohol is no ordinary commodity. Yes, it contributes to the, uh, the agricultural sector, uh, provides employment, uh, provides entertainment and sociability, and does all these things for society. But one of the things that comes out when you look at this vast literature over the last 100 years, and particularly over the past uh, 30 or 40 years coming out of the scientific uh, journals, uh, is that uh, the benefits connected with the production and the sale and uh, the distribution of alcohol uh, come at a tremendous cost to society. And uh, the World Health Organization has begun to quantify those costs in terms of what they call the global burden of disease. And when you compare all the risk factors that contribute to all the causes of disability and death in the world. Alcohol comes out close to the top in most areas of the world. It's among the top five in just about every region except the Middle East and, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, what we have is a commodity that causes a tremendous amount of health damage and uh, damage to the social fabric. It's the leading risk factor for certain forms of cardiovascular disease, for cancers, accidents and injuries. Uh, we documented uh, causal relationships between alcohol and about 50 uh, or 60 uh, health conditions. And uh, the evidence is, is incontroversial. Uh, incontroversial. Uh, the the uh, mechanisms that account for this have been investigated. And what we now know that there are perhaps uh, at least three major mechanisms. Alcohol is a toxic agent when it's taken in 
uh, steady and high quantities, but uh, it begins about two drinks a day. Uh, and when you get up to five or six drinks, you're at very high risk of liver cirrhosis, uh, uh, certain types of heart disease, and accidents and injuries. The second mechanism is intoxication, completely different mechanism, but alcohol impairs psychomotor performance. And when you go to an emergency room on a Friday or Saturday night, you find lots of people there because uh, they had a little bit too much to drink or they had a lot to drink. Either way, they were impaired. Uh, they had some sort of a health crisis and they had to be taken for, uh, for a, a medical attention. The third mechanism where alcohol does its harm is addiction or uh, alcohol dependence. And uh, that is the classic example that everyone points to. But <clears throat> when you look at the epidemiological data, you find that alcoholism or dependence only accounts for about half of the damage that alcohol does. The other part is done by people just drinking too much who aren't alcoholics. It's kids getting drunk on a weekend or somebody going to a wedding and getting into a traffic accident because they drank too much. So uh, there are many more of those people than there are alcoholics, but the damage is almost comparable. So there's plenty of scientific evidence to document the damage. The question is, what can we do about it? And the major purpose of the book that we put together was to look at the various ways that societies have tried to control this vast public health problem and uh, the research evidence that suggests whether they work or not. And as it turns out, there's been a lot of research in the last 30 or 40 years, research by economists, research by psychologists, research by sociologists. Uh, many disciplines have been devoted to looking at the effects of drunk driving laws, the effects of uh, just say no laws uh, or, or recommendations, primary prevention, uh, treatment of alcohol dependence, controls on availability, uh, and so on and so forth. We evaluated over 43 strategies and interventions that had been used uh, throughout the world to control alcohol problems. And we found evidence for the effectiveness of uh, approximately two-thirds of them. A number of them were ineffective but still used. The conclusions that we drew were that um, there are at least four mechanisms that you can use to control alcohol-related problems. Uh, control physical availability, and uh, through age restrictions and your rates of uh, late night traffic fatalities in 16 and 17 years old, year olds go down dramatically as they did in the United States. You can control hours of sale, density of outlets, and uh, time of purchase, uh, and you reduce uh, alcohol problems. If you liberalize those policies, as has happened in the UK, you get an epidemic of binge drinking on the streets. Uh, economic availability controls. Uh, price uh, is a major lever that uh, can be used to control alcohol-related problems. When the price of alcohol decreases due to uh, uh, failure to index excise taxes to inflation, then you get more consumption. When you raise taxes or in other ways control the price of alcohol, uh, you get reductions in alcohol-related problems. Uh, another way to control problems or to exacerbate them is through uh, psychological availability. Marketing activities interest young people, get them started earlier, and when they begin to drink, they're imitating the models they see in uh, much of contemporary alcohol advertising, which is teaching people how to drink heavily. Uh, social availability controls are another way. Uh, when we control the drinking context by uh, stopping people when they're drinking too much, uh, or when we have drunk driving measures where uh, they're based on deterrence rather than punishment, and people uh, think that they might get apprehended at a roadside uh, 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 road uh, sobriety checkpoint, uh, you, get, you can get dramatic reductions in uh, drunk driving. So there are a variety of levers that have been identified through 
a tremendous amount of research, hundreds of studies, hundreds of uh, uh, scores of literature reviews in each of these areas, which indicate which policies are effective and which ones are not. Putting that all together, uh, we can ask ourselves, what are the effects of the consolidation and concentration of the alcohol industry uh, on these levers that either increase or decrease alcohol consumption. Uh, <clears throat> we have the uh, uh, evidence that uh, the major producers are concentrating not just in the United States but all over the world. And it's not only happening in the beer industry, it's happening in the distilled spirits and to a lesser extent in the wine industry. Uh, along with the concentration of the major producers, you have delegation of a lot of their public relations and uh, uh, political activity to third party organizations. And some of its trade associations, the, the more significant work is done by front organizations like uh, uh, what are called uh, uh, social aspect organizations that conduct lobbying for industry interests but also do corporate social responsibility work. Other things that are happening are with concentration, you get more money focused on marketing. Uh, it's a strategy that has been well publicized in the business literature as the uh, consumption in the developed countries has leveled off. You've gotten the major producers moving into Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, and the profits that accrue from economies of scale, of scale are being reallocated to uh, more aggressive marketing activities. Uh, product design is another one. Mike's Hard Lemonade, uh, sweetened alcohol beverages, uh, caffeinated drinks, designed for a target population. If you look at the internal documents that the Home Office in the UK subpoenaed, uh, you can find that uh, even among the emails of the executives, there seems to be a discussion of how these beverages and the marketing strategies, tra uh, uh, marketing strategies are targeted at this demographic, which is right at the border of what we would call uh, underage drinking. Partnerships with NGOs and the public health community are a way of, of uh, getting good public relations, but also neutralizing uh, people who are raising objections and promoting a public health interest. Lobbying uh, almost uh, most often is done uh, against public health measures. Uh, and it's done for economic reasons, but uh, sometimes it's argued that it doesn't help public health, even though we know that when uh, taxes are reasonably uh, uh, make alcohol less affordable, uh, and when controls on availability make alcohol less available, we know that those will uh, improve the health of a population, but they're still opposed. Uh, marketing self-regulation is a big industry uh, a priority, which is being promoted worldwide. And the activities of the industry in this area seem to be leading to a uh, environment where alcohol marketing is only minimally controlled. Uh, uh, research that we've done suggests that uh, the two major producers uh, in this country, Anheuser-Busch, uh, MBEV, and uh, SAB Miller, uh, when it comes to the NC. Double A games, for example, over the past 10 years are responsible for broadcasting ads to a mixed audience of, of uh, underage and of age drinkers, uh, ads that in their content contain significant violations. Up, uh, uh, up to 50% of the ads have violations identified by raiders uh, from a public health perspective. So there's evidence from the literature not only that taxes and availability controls and drunk driving laws and um, uh, <clears throat> uh, um, controls on, on marketing work, but there's evidence that, that uh, uh, self-regulation is not working. What we see is a, uh, the elements of a uh, theory of causality that uh, comes from 
the, not the genetics of the individual, which do play a role, or the personality of the drinker, which can play a role in excessive drinking. But we see uh, activities of corporations, often in collusion with governments, that create an environment, uh, often an economic environment, that affects public health. And we can start tracing the causal mechanisms through what we call an epidemiological cascade that starts with the decisions of uh, corporate executives and uh, the public relations firms that they have uh, in opposing public health legislation and designing products that fit a target population that wouldn't ordinarily be seeking these products. And uh, combining marketing, setting up the organizations, lobbying, uh, product design, uh, and uh, policies or lobbying for policies that lower price and increase availability. All of this constitutes a perfect storm for uh, an alcohol epidemic. So uh, in conclusion, I'd leave you with uh, an image that I have of uh, uh, being a graduate student at the University of Arizona over 30 years ago and walking around the campus on a Friday night. And it would be pretty tranquil. Uh, fast forward about uh, 20 years when my son was a student out there and I went to visit him uh, and he was at a party uh, and I was walking around the campus on a Friday night and it was bizarre. Uh, people standing out in front of buildings and dormitories and fraternity houses and sorority houses, all drinking, uh, people intoxicated, uh, police cars coming here to and fro, ambulances coming in and out. It was a real zoo. What accounted for this change? Similar changes in the UK, as Tim has suggested, where 30 years ago, you could walk on a Friday night in a small center city and not experience anybody who was harassing you or who was drunk. Now you have to step over drunken bodies to get into a restaurant. Uh, it is, again, a real zoo. Uh, I think the evidence that we've accumulated or put together suggests that <clears throat> it's within the powers, the levers of both governments and corporations to control these epidemics, to control them by either increasing heavy drinking or decreasing heavy drinking, uh, mainly through controls on uh, economic availability, physical availability, social availability, and psychological availability. Thank you. So oftentimes when I'm on a panel and discussing this issue, I, uh, I, I know there's people out in the audience oftentimes thinking, so what's she doing up there? <laughs> what's the faith community have to say about this? And I think that uh, one of the things that I recognize in terms of the work that we do on alcohol policy, public policy advocacy as a church, is that um, we, do, we oftentimes don't, um, have to spend a lot of time interpreting both um, uh, why we work on this issue and also uh, with um, likely partners explain why we're in the room in the first place. And um, I, I, think what, I think it really stems from those of us who are clergy uh, oftentimes see the sort of the downstream outcomes of addiction of, um, and of alcoholism. I'm reminded of when I first began working, um, I worked in direct services and uh, one of the things that I that really instigated my uh, work um, or catalyzed my my wanting to move upstream in working on public policy was this young man who kept coming in time after time after short term treatment, long term treatment, and um, uh, who was uh, so um, had had been addicted to alcohol for so long that he was no longer his brain was no longer no longer had the ability really to um, to, to allow him to be in a functioning member of society. 
and um, the frustration that we as clergy feel when we um, t when we see those kind those kinds of issues and problems coming in our door time and time again those outcomes and 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 realizing that uh, the churches oftentimes our work is focused on um, uh, dealing with that uh, downstream problem by working on recovery, working on recovery ministry. That's something that's very comfortable for churches and faith communities to do is to, to work in the field of recovery. And, um, and realizing that there, there was a large, there was a much more expansive way that, that we needed to be looking at this. And so the General Board of Church of Society is actually the, the, the body that inherited um, the, the historic work of the United Methodist Church under the Board of Temperance and Public Morals. They worked in, um, they, they were seminal in the movement in relation to prohibition and then afterwards in temperance and the setup of the three-tier system. And, and um, one of the things that the, as we've moved towards contemporary issues and, and worked on uh, addressing this problem by, by addressing it from an effective public health standpoint, is to help our church, help our churches and our local communities to come along there, and it has been a challenge, I think, at the local level to interpret some of this work. Uh, Tom's seminal book, um, "Alcohol No Ordinary Commodity," um, to me was life changing and transforming for me. But how to interpret that to others in our in my local com in our local community, and. And so we, we began this uh, campaign of education first, and then uh, we're now in the second phase of this education uh, in organizing United Methodists. And Tom, for instance, has been on in national phone calls with United Methodists from around the country about why it matters that we address public policy, why it matters that the church become involved with the other stakeholders. And I think it boils down to some of the issues that Tom addresses. We care about the public good. We care about the common good. Um, we stakeholders that are in public health and in the faith community. We care about uh, the ability for every member of society to thrive. And anything that stands in the way or an obstacle to our ability to thrive is something that we need to pay attention to and we need to address. And this issue, I think one of the most troubling aspects of the work that we do in the U.S. is that we allow the industry at the table of public health. I, I you know, I've said very, very candidly in public arenas that I feel like the alcohol industry has no business being at the table of public health addressing these issues, that it ought to be those stakeholders that keep in mind the common good and the ability for humans to thrive at every level, and so that that young man who is in, that I saw can be a functioning member of society. We've done um, the the kind of education we've done is we've taken the things that public health has done and the article that that um, Mr. Heffernan has done as well, and and interpreted through the lens of the faith community. And one of, one of the things we've done is sort of develop a language around that, a language that we're familiar with, but yet addresses the issue. So uh, we we developed sort of a platform for that in our work, um, where we said that every person ought to have uh, available to them God's vision for them of abundance and healing, of community that humanity is valued above everything else, including um, and in a society where oftentimes the economic interests are above the human interests, it's very countercultural to think that, to, excuse me, to think that way. And then also finally restoration or transformation, that there's an ability to restore people to thriving and, be, and being a functioning member of society. And so that public policy weighs in on that, that public policy matters, that it's not simply about recovery ministry. Otherwise, we never get to the point of abundance. We never get to the point where we're in community and we care about each other in our society. We never get to the point where we value human beings above corporations or industry, and we never get to um, the point where so, uh, people can attain true restoration or transformation unless we tackle those root causes. Tom did it, Tom in his usual excellent way addresses some of the things that need to be tackled. And the faith community, I think, in terms of educating them, once they become aware of of why we need to work on public policy. They can be a force to be reckoned with with other stakeholders in communities where faith, um, law enforcement, and public health have worked together. 
you find effective policy, I believe you find lower addiction rates, you find social costs addressed in a comprehensive and integral way with integrity and favoring the common good. It allows less loopholes, in my opinion, to um, industry to be um, to try to water down policy, to try to water down regulation, to try to do away with those effective measures that have proven, as Tom said, through countless research, countless research um, and papers and, and studies, to show that um, that it these that if you enact these measures, you have a society that values the common good. I like um, I like the word. Uh, just rather than moral, because I think moral often has a lot, oftentimes has negative connotations or baggage associated with it. In fact, the alcohol industry uses it to exploit or weaken the message of the faith community. They use that word because people attach those negative connotations to it. So the words we use in the faith community are just, common good, the ability to thrive. These are all things that we believe. They're not. Uh, it's not a manipulation of the word moral, rather it's things we intrinsically believe as faith communities. And it's things that we, um, that we see as, as our creator, our God's vision to, for, um, for our world, and both um, in the U.S. and then globally as well. So, uh, and, and, the, and the faith community is a key is a key member of the, of the community that works on this because we're trusted messengers. We're trusted advocates in a society that's increasingly skeptical and critical of those who carry messages. In a place, in a, in a society where there's much misinformation that's out there, uh, one place where there are trusted messengers is in the faith community. So we, one of the principal things we do is make sure that our local people are informed. We're, we continue to work on that campaign. We're activating them in key places, lo both at the local level and then up all the way to the national or the federal level. And um, our, you know, in every faith community are also our local community leaders. Uh, almost to a, you know, ma many of our local leaders, both in city councils and county government at the state level, and at the national level have a connection in some way most to a faith community. And so it's very important to involve the commu that community in the effort because they can be a for they can be a force to be reckoned with. We um, we've proven that um, both on the issue of tobacco, for instance, we've been heavily involved in the issue of tobacco, and we hope to continue um, to do work as effectively on this as well in the alcohol industry. Well, hold on. I'm the last one. For, for those of you who want to get up and do a couple of jumping jacks or something here because you've been sitting for a long time. I'm Jerry Oliver and I am uh, uh, grateful uh, to be a part of this panel. Uh, I am uh, not as distinguished as some of the panelists here. I am not a journalist of great note, a uh, professor at a university or a uh, renowned uh, uh, theologian. I'm a cop. Uh, I'm a guy who spent 40 years in policing, and uh, I want to offer you a few perspectives about the execution level, uh, what we've been talking about. What's, uh, what's always interesting to me in conversations like this is long after uh, the the, the people who represent all the institutions uh, go home at 5 o'clock. It is the police officers who are out here to deal with all of the institutional failures, all the experiments, and all of the great ideas that went by the wayside. It's the police officers, and many of them very young police officers, uh, who have not had the kind of life experiences that many of you have had have to clean up the mess that a lot of the decisions uh, are, have been made. So that's what I want to I want to do. I want to lean into about three perspectives here, as uh, from my career over 40 years of being at the execution level, um, dealing with a lot of the issues that we've been talking about uh, today. 
Uh, as Barry, uh, as was mentioned um, in the introduction, I've been a police chief in Detroit, Michigan. I was a police chief in Richmond, Virginia. I've been a police chief in Pasadena, California. I retired from the Phoenix Police Department after 21 years. I've spent a great deal of time with PERF, which is the Police Executive Research Forum, um, IACP, which is the International Association of Chiefs of Police. I ran their community, community policing consortium for a number of years. Um, and the Police Foundation, I've done several internships, many times studying some of the same issues that we are talking about here today. Um, and so the three perspectives that I want to really lean into with you briefly uh, is from a law enforcement perspective, um, from a perspective of a state regulator, because I was al also the director for several years, the director of liquor, the ABC director uh, in the state of Arizona. And then I want to talk a little bit about my experience uh, just briefly with the Center of Alcohol Policy, which, uh, where I serve as an advisor uh, at the moment. Um, I totally agree with uh, the statement and, and uh, Mr. Baber's book, Alcohol is No Ordinary Commodity. It's been mentioned several times. Um, and as a police chief, I can, can't agree with that title more. Uh, not from an academic standpoint, but from a standpoint of actually seeing that is no, the effects of the no ordinary um, commodity. Alcohol brings people together in great celebration, and alcohol can turn, tear whole communities and whole neighborhoods apart. I've seen that with my own eyes. Not something that somebody told me about, but something that I've seen. Properly regulated, the physical availability and, the dealing, and dealing with the abuse and misuse is huge for those of us who has been and continue to be in liquor law enforcement and law enforcement in general. In fact, perhaps no stakeholder is more directly affected by the liberalization of alcohol regulations or the tendency we have towards deregulation uh, or the erosion of the standards that we've had over the last 80 years. Uh, yet, too often, law enforcement's input and expertise is not sought or even considered before new laws or political-based initiatives are enacted. And I can give you a really salient example. A few years ago, a decision was made that we would no longer arrest, we would no longer arrest people who were intoxicated in public if that was their only infraction. And that police officers were asked then, or demanded, police officers were demanded to call a social service agency to come and take those people away. Well, when the budget cuts came and they cut the social service agency, <clears throat> we did not change the law. No one consulted with the police officers. And so now where are these people? What kind of problems did that cause with people laying on the streets where many of you recently probably have stepped over people who are intoxicated laying in the streets? And police officers are unarmed and not abil with no ability to deal with that at all from a criminal justice system. And I can tell you, <laughs> Just from experience, that I, I, I had, police, I had um, individuals that I knew when I was a patrolman working the street that would come up and knock on my car window when I was sitting there doing my paperwork and ask me if they could go to jail because they were cold or hungry or they were, they were looking for some agency that would help them and really couldn't find one for many different reasons. But a decision was made without consulting the police department or policing, the industry of policing, and that was a real problem. Um, so as a stakeholder, it is very important that we're at the table uh, before new laws or political-based initiatives are enacted. The role of law enforcement in communicating threats to public health and safety from deregulation of alcohol sales by initiative or budget cuts are important because action uh, has a significant impact on local police resources. The lawlessness the coming from the misuse of of an abuse, actually, of, uh, of alcohol is a common denominator uh, in a substantial portion of everyday law enforcement. Let me tell you that on a 24-hour-a-day clock, or maybe even a seven-day week calendar, um, alcohol is responsible for many of the spikes of demand.
From early morning through late night, alcohol inspires aggression, whether personal violence, such as suicide, interpersonal violence, such as rape, homicide, or domestic abuse, group violence, and unruliness that was just talked about just a minute ago on campuses or riotous acts at sporting events or vehicle violence such as deadly DUI uh, crashes is a major concern to everyone, especially local law enforcement or local leaders, and seeking, seeking to effectively deploy the resources to address these issues on a 24-hour-a-day or seven-day-a-week basis. Um, for, for instance, in a recent study, according to the Justice Department, which is, has the Bureau of Justice Statistics, BJA, 40% uh, of all offenders arrested going back to 2008 uh, had been using alcohol at the time of the offense uh, they were convicted of. But regardless of these facts, many states are considering weakening various alcohol laws in the name of consumer confidence, or excuse me, con consumer convenience consumer choice, increased uh, revenues to satisfy, satisfy some questionable industry accommodation. Few has seriously included or even considered the views of law enforcement uh, or any of these changes, on any of these changes. Since law enforcement will bear the effects um, of these changes, there should be, uh, they should be closely consulted at the outset in order that proper planning and resources can be obtained and ass assigned. And, as I mentioned, being a part of some of these national police organizations, that's one of the major complaints uh, that police officers and police chiefs around the country make, and that decisions are made and they find out about them later. Other proposals involved uh, the privatization of control states' alcohol businesses in order to increase sales outlets and hours of sale. In order for privatization to replace lost control state revenues, the volume available in outlets where alcohol are sold, is sold, must often increase as well. More locations for alcohol sales increase the need for more liquor law enforcement and liquor law enforcement compliance checks to reduce the illegal sales to minors and over service to intoxicated individuals. Some of the other effects of privatization and expanded access points, the need to change liquor law enforcement staff training to um, match the ever-evolving retail alcohol products and many of the new retail alcohol business models that are out there. I mean, uh, some of that was alluded to earlier, but now you can buy not only beer, but spirits and movies and on trolley cars and sporting events, nail salons, barber shops. I mean, you can, uh, it's the ever-expanding places where there's an opportunity for abuse and misuse. Um, I was told a story last night uh, at dinner about uh, a nudist colony uh, in Arizona that uh, wanted to open a bar. And the problems that that caused for us, and how do you do enforcement at a nudist colony? How do you do anything covertly? I mean, what officers are you going to send there? What liquor officers are you going to send and not be identified, and then work in a store their badges. So, <laughs> so more alcohol consumption in addition to criminal matters uh, mentioned earlier, increased calls for public, excuse me, for police service uh, on order maintenance issues. And it was something that we don't really talk about much, but disorderly conduct and disturbing the peace and laudering and any number of nuisance and annoyances calls that police officers receive uh, about I'd say 15 or 20 percent of police officers, 24 hour a day, calls for service have to do with real criminal matters. Obviously about 80 percent of the calls deal with these annoyance calls, in, and, and many of them at increased personal risk and exposure uh, to violence to first responders at all levels. And then the need to radically review regulatory budgets uh, to address additional police technology and equipment at a time when government funds are being uh, cut back and are, are very thin. State regulator, as a state regulator, uh, in 2007, it was mentioned earlier, the Governor Napolitano, um, at the time, now Secretary Napolitano, um, asked me to trade in my law enforcement credentials for uh, a post at the Arizona uh, Liquor Licenses and Control. Uh, state alcohol regulators are also missing in action 
at the table of a lot of decisions that are being made. Um, and they have a lot to, to say about the balance, the market balance, and the forces of, that affect regulation and distribution and consumption of alcohol. In my case, with all of about 30 employees, for a state that has 12,000 licensees, um, and when I left there, we had 12 real enforcers for 15 counties. And if you're familiar with Arizona, some of our counties are bigger than some states in the east. And we had one enforcer for the entire county. Um, it was no way to really if effectively and evenly apply state alcohol beverage control laws. However, could I, as an Arizona state alcohol regulator, affect a global alcohol uh, company um, who does business around the world? No. Did alcohol companies care that I thought or what I thought or wanted to do as the chief Arizona regulator? Probably not. Uh, but in those in-state alcohol, but those in-state alcohol uh, retailers and distributors were very much aware of the department's needs and the department's charge to ensure responsible uh, sale and consumption of alcohol beverages. Um, in many states, and in many, and especially I noticed this in Arizona, um, actually the industry, and this is somewhat different from what um, was stated this morning, uh, what Steve had to say, Mr. Higginbotham had to say about what was going on in Ar Arkansas. It was my experience, though, that um, generally the, the industry gave lip service uh, in support of strong regulation. They would talk about strong regulation and the need for strong regulation and the need for the three-tier system uh, which depended on strong regulation, um, but uh, they were absent many times at the legislature where the real tough decisions were made about budgets. Uh, and since uh, the state alcohol regulator doesn't have a checkbook, uh, and lobbyists generally do, sometimes we were left on the short end of the decision-making process. So uh, I offer the perspective of a former law enforcement leader and a state alcohol regulator to this debate about resources and where the resources ought to be spent, um, and that anything uh, that can augment and improve the role and resources of state regulators and liquor law enforcement should be taken. And then finally, I want to just mention briefly about the Center for Alcohol Policy. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to uh, be an advisor there, and I, um, I'm, I feel very privileged to be a part of what's going on at the Center for Alcohol Policy. Uh, CAP, as we call it, is, was established in 2007. Uh, it is intended to foster debate, education, analysis, research, examination of state alcohol regulations, and its implications for citizens across the United States. Uh, the center is an organization that seeks to find common ground among various interests interested in alcohol policy and getting, to them, uh, getting them to communicate in ways that they normally don't communicate. Uh, in the center's alcohol symposiums, which I find really interesting, the president of Mother, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, for instance, uh, share their concerns and positions in the same room with state regulators, uh, officials, uh, religious leaders, community organizers, and key representatives of the alcohol industry. And in some ways, this is a little bit different from what you said. I, I really think it's really healthy to have everybody in the room. Uh, talking about uh, public health issues or even alcohol policy. Public health advocates are briefed on troublesome regulatory issues facing the states and local jurisdictions, and by sharing ideas, concerns, engaging in dialogue, and forging consensus, better policy, I think, results uh, and interdisciplinary relationships are achieved. Um, the Center, uh, through educational efforts like our annual essay contest, support the 21st Amendment that grants states and local governments alcohol beverage control authority within, the, within their budgets, um, excuse me, within their borders. Um, the three-tier system that we've been talking about today effectively, effectively works against the normal efficiencies that would come with vertical integration and enhances responsible alcohol consumption in our view. Two projects uh, I would like to highlight from the center. One is a uh, white paper the center sponsored about three years ago. It, it was entitled The Dangers of Alcohol Deregulation um, in the UK, in the United King Kingdom. 
uh, which we've talked about uh, a little bit here today. Uh, this report was written by Pam Erickson, and it really underscores the problems with alcohol deregulation in the United Kingdom. Um, Tim covered it, much of this uh, in his comments and in his article, so I won't repeat any of that. But what I will say, though, is that from a law enforcement policing execution level standpoint, it's, it's very clear that we do not want uh, to go there in this country, in our country. And then finally, the center uh, last year pr reprinted the seminal treaties on alcohol regulation towards liquor control. Uh, it's been referenced uh, several times here today. It's referenced in some of the literature that you've received here today. This is a, um, it really is very relevant. Even though it was written in 1933 or about then, it's about 80 years old, but it's very relevant to what we're talking about today. And if you have any at all, any claim to be interested in alcohol regulation or alcohol deregulation, or the discussions about the three-tier system or about um, the local control, you, you have to get a copy of this book and you have to read it. Uh, you can get a copy, a complimentary copy, actually, from the Center for Alcohol Policy. Um, you can also pay a small fee and get it on Amazon.com or uh, receive it from the, um, from the Center's website, CenterForAlcoholPolicy.com. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank the panelists for an extremely enlightening uh, uh, session here. Uh, you know, Tim, when we launched our, our investigation uh, with the help of, of, of Barry and, and Phil Longman, um, we were coming at this from, a, from the point of view of, of industry consolidation and sort of found our way to the issue of, of the of of the street level issues of uh, alcohol availability, abuse, and so forth. And um, it was logic that kind of led us there, at least me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, in this business, you, you, you do so much reporting, and then you, you trust that uh, the reporting is leading you in the right direction, but you don't know if, uh, you don't necessarily know how right you are or how not right you are. And one of the gratifying things for me is is to 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 be in the presence of folks who do this for a living, and have independently through their own research over many many years, their own experience over many many years, um, found their way to to where we started, and and we found our way to to you. Um, uh, the other thing that occurred to me li listening to all this is, you know. Um, we have to be about 10 or 15 years ahead of the country on this issue. I don't think that I don't think that this issue has at all permeated the world. Um, it, it has in the UK. It took an enormous amount of damage and many many years uh, of living with rising alcohol abuse, um, uh, stemming from the deregulation of their markets and the evolution the consolidation of their markets. What's different in the United States is we have a system that's kept it from going in that direction, but that that system is being eaten away like a, like a fine home with termites. And, and I guess the question, the, 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 the question in my mind is, um, given that no one knows about this stuff, right, uh, other than people who studied it, people in the business, people who deal, cops and, and, and uh, ministers and so forth who deal with the end result. Uh, uh, how do you marshal interest in preserving something which, once it's gone, creates tremendous problems? Do we have to wait for the whole darn thing to collapse? Do we have to wait for millions of extra alcohol abuse cases before we think, you know, maybe we had a good thing going uh, before. Um, so I, I don't know how to, I don't know, even begin to know how to answer that question. But let me, let me begin uh, with some questions. And I, first, um, Reverend, I want to ask, ask you, you said something uh, interesting. You said that 
for the faith community, dealing with uh, recovery is a comfortable uh, role. There is the need, the need isn't being met, and, and, uh, and uh, it's a natural role for, for the, the, the faith community, for churches. But I think what you were saying was that after some time of dealing with the consequences, one begins to look upstream at what's, what is bringing this flow of, of destruction down on you. And, you know, uh, I, I went to college in Evanston, which is the home of the Ladies Women's Temperance League. And we all, you know, at Northwestern chugging our beers <laughs> about, about, the, the, about, about the prohibition movement. And I think it, in the minds of most Americans, the notion of doing something, especially from the faith community, about alcohol leads us right back to that quote unquote failed experiment, mm -hmm. which by the way didn't fail as in every respect. Alcohol abuse and uh, did go down dramatically during the era of prohibition. Um, so I guess my question to you is, is there among your peers in your denomination and other denominations any kind of growing awareness that the damage that you're seeing down at, at the grassroots level is being affected by changes in the market structure of uh, alcohol companies at the top? And if not, what do, you need, what do we need to do to get some awareness among the faith community? I don't think it's percolated down enough. I mean, it's just begun to, we've just begun to have those discussions. I think, uh, I think one, uh, there's some barriers to that. One, one barrier is um, when we speak um, oftentimes at the, you know, social scientist, theoretical, academic, academic language level of it, um, uh, it's important to remember how to translate that down to the ordinary folk at the, at the local level and in congregations in churches and temples and mosques. And, and uh, I, I think until we do that and show the direct cor correlation, I think people who do recovery ministry and who do the direct services day in and day out understand that there's a greater, that, the, that it stems from a greater source. I mean, that the, 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 the root of this issue is at a greater source. What I don't think they understand or what I think that um, we, we need to do a better job at is educating them on effective actions to address that and to have voices that are strong and unequivocal about why, we, why we're in this in the first place. What, uh, I, you know, when you have uh, well-funded adversaries, I think it's important that um, people hear from groups who have the public interest at heart, who, groups who have public health and public interest at heart. And it's very and and one of those effective forces can be, as I said, the um, the faith community. But uh, until but we need to continue to do that translation so that people at the local level understand that correlation. And I think it, one of the most effective pieces of the article was the comparison with the UK because it shows you what the worst case scenario is going to be, or at least part of the worst case scenario. I think it could get even worse than that actually. But um, but it, it gives a pretty clear picture of what it would look like if we don't, if we um, uh, Swiss cheese the three-tier system, which is what's happening. And, and, and uh, I think that we have to be good interpreters of that. We have to, and, and we have to have messengers that do that um, in addition to the social scientists that we need to involve and train and educate others that can go out and be those sources. So, that, so that's why it's so important for us to do that with faith leaders. And I think that's the case, I think, for law enforcement too. Uh, you know, being, being the interpreter for law enforcement. I, I think one of the most eye-opening um, presentations I had was uh, when, a, when law enforcement, the Law Enforcement Association described some of the things that they do day in and day out in the evening um, in trying to address these downstream pieces and why they want to work on the upstream. So it's just a matter of connecting all the, connecting that web of people who care and instead of being on parallel tracks. Thank you very much. Um, doctor, uh, oh please, if, if there's somebody who wants to weigh in, I, I don't mean to, Dr. Baber, you, um, your uh, 
very, very uh, pithy and, and informative description of where the literature is and what we've learned over many, many years, but most particularly in the last 20 or 30, about what works and what works less well. Uh, I, I just found um, extraordinary and, and very, very helpful. Um, is there, you know, as you give talks around the country and around the world, uh, any sense uh, um, that there is a market for what you're saying among elected officials at any level of government, but most especially at the, at the national level? Because, frankly, one of the reasons that this story appealed to us is uh, in, in our broader interests in the consolidation of various industries is that this is one uh, that everyone can relate to where the damage of consolidation is not a, a diffuse one of price and choice and so forth, but, but, but you know, the destruction of human thriving, as, you, as the Reverend was saying. I'm wondering, though, with this new information, have you, have you seen public officials' eyes opening up to, to the dangers that you're talking about? <clears throat> I, th I think the short answer is yes. The eyes of public officials are beginning to open up. They're looking for advice, but at the same time, it's discouraging because what is also happening is that there's a window of opportunity that uh, is closing possibly quite <clears throat> rapidly. Uh, examples, uh, because I get called, because I do work with the World Health Organization, uh, and I also do uh, free consulting with any public interest group that wants to uh, uh, hear what I have to say. But uh, I've consulted with uh, the Nordic Council, which represents the Nordic countries in the European Union, and the European Union is uh, perhaps the area of the world that has the highest rates of alcohol consumption and alcohol problems. <clears throat> and they're being devastated by alcohol problems and they try, they succeed in some cases, but they fail in others. In Lithuania, I was over there uh, at the invitation of an NGO a couple of years ago. They were very optimistic because the uh, parliament had passed a ban on alcohol advertising. Uh, but uh, at the last minute, the president delayed the uh, implementation of the ban for two years. I happened to be back there last uh, year when the two-year period was over and the parliament at the last minute reversed that ban. And uh, now, from what I hear newspaper reports from people in the country, uh, there's a scandal that the parliamentarians had been paid off to vote. Uh, in Africa, uh, there have been conferences organized by alcohol industry representatives in many of the countries uh, where government officials, NGOs, academics, and people are brought together, all funded by the alcohol industry. They produce a report that all comes from the same word processor of uh, a, an executive in an alcohol corporation. And uh, they're presented to the governments as a model for alcohol policy for that country. Most of those countries have no or very weak alcohol policies, and they're starting to experience concentration of the same industry we're talking about here, except that they're expanding into a market where the potential for growing the market is huge. And uh, it's very discouraging because public health officials are left out of the policymaking process. Uh, so you get a lot of interest among policymakers, public health people, uh, but the struggle is that uh, we're competing in this marketplace of ideas with uh, ec very strong economic interests. And uh, it didn't used to be that way. It becomes concentrated, so you're seeing the same faces whether you go to Africa or Asia or Latin America. Well, you know, you, you bring up a great point, and, and that is... Um, and it's something that really we didn't, Tim, 
get that deeply into in the article, but that's the issue of political economy. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the chief reasons, the, the, and I, I, I'm uh, translating the, the wisdom of, uh, of my fellow, my colleagues, Phil Longman and, and Barry Lynn here, but the progressive era effort to hem in the size of corporations was precisely so that they wouldn't grow to such size through monopoly power that they could manipulate the political process and drown out the voices of law enforcement, the faith community, public health officials, local officials, entrepreneurs, et cetera, with, uh, with gobs of money and phony studies and so forth. So um, I think that the, uh, the narrowing of the window you talk about, you talked about is, is very true. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Oliver, I, I, I guess I'll ask you the, the same question. Does, you have over here law enforcement, as you say, the, the group that, that, it, that has to clean up the mess from the decisions the elected officials and others make without uh, your uh, community's input. Um, uh, and then you have these problems of political economy happening that Tim describes in his book. Um, it would seem to me invaluable if one wanted to do something about this problem of concentration, let's say in the, in the, in the alcohol industry, to have law enforcement's input, uh, to have law enforcement's backing, frankly, its support for doing something. Um, is there, and I, it's basically the same question I, I asked the Reverend, Reverend Abrams, is there a, any real understanding in law enforcement that, that these two things are connected? that the consolidation of the liquor industry and the attacks on the three-tiered system will, are leading to, will lead to problems that, that cops on the beat are gonna have to clean up. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think police leadership uh, and some of the organizations that I described earlier certainly get it, they understand that. Um, and I agree with Reverend Abrams that um, Police leaders, law enforcement leaders, liquor law enforcement leaders uh, want to move and be a part of um, the decision making upstream um, because we do see what happens downstream. And uh, to the extent that we can and when we have been involved, we've been able to avert some real catastrophes in our, from a public health standpoint and from a community standpoint. I mean, uh, in my career, I've had an opportunity to work with many people in the academic community, for instance, um, certainly with the, the center um, and with other organizations that have had the opportunity to have input early on. And um, it's, a, it's a win-win for everyone. Um, so I think we're, we get it. I don't think the necessarily policing overall get it because uh, that's not where they are. They, they are hired to be uh, warriors and uh, hard to be the people that um, sort of the, the, the sort of go to war against crime and this many times is seen as a um, social service or sort of a, a less than policing kind of a thing but this is what we do 80 percent of the time for those of us who know that we're eager to work with uh, in law enforcement and liquor law enforcement to work with other uh, areas of the um, at our society to really come up with these with solutions to some of these problems before they get to be major problems on the street. Great. Um, I think we should open up uh, some questions from the from the audience. Unless so Tim, you had you wanted to comment on on any anything that's been said, or or we could wait for. Okay, so so um, uh, we have. Uh, please uh, raise your hand, and and uh, the mic will be passed to you. And if you uh, have an affiliation, please state it and also state your name. I'm Bernie Asher, a research fellow with the American Antitrust Institute. Um, thank you for your presentation on the other side of the question, the social and the safety and health problems associated with this, with this product. Um, my questions, though, are really geared to the competition policy. Uh, one question is whether any other country in the world has a three-tier distribution system, 
And if so, uh, what is the U.S. performance? How does that match up with these other countries? Now, I realize that uh, you have 43 mechanisms. It's going to be very hard to make a judgment about that. I, I don't know if there have been any, any studies to that effect. Second question is, um, if we had a monopoly for beer or all alcoholic beverages, is the fear among the health and safety community that prices will be lowered to such an extent that there would be overconsumption of alcoholic beverages. That's what I've been reading, which would be completely opposite to what the fear of monopolies is, that they would raise prices and hurt consumers. So those are my two questions. Thanks. Um, Dr. Baber, you want to take a shot at the first at least, and maybe the others can talk to the second? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I'm not aware of um, the structure of the uh, alcohol distribution and production system in different countries. Uh, there are a variety of different models. Some of them will resemble what uh, the U.S. has. Others have more of a monopoly system where the state controls the monopoly. And what we've learned from looking at alcohol control is regardless of the system, whether it's three-tiered or one-tiered, the main vehicle for controlling the health and public uh, safety issues in a country is the extent to which the control system uh, is capable of uh, limiting the uh, universal availability of alcohol and uh, limiting the price and in some cases limiting the uh, uh, distribution or sale of alcohol below market prices. This happened in the UK where it's used as a loss leader. And now there is a large movement uh, uh, which is partially successful, I think, in Scotland to have a minimum price on alcohol, and it's probably going to happen in the UK too. So the three tiers theoretically uh, should help to uh, prevent the uh, excessive availability of alcohol and lowering the price. But there are other mechanisms to accomplish that. Yeah, I can probably take some of the, the pricing questions. Um, you know, I think that at least the concern that we had or that I had in the paper is not um, necessarily just flat lowering of prices, but that the monopoly power that uh, the, the two major beer brewers have already accumulated allows them to um, manipulate the price um, of their products, both for sale to their wholesalers and then ultimately on the market, manipulate it in, in ways that greatly favor uh, their business models and greatly disfavor, obviously, competition. Um, I suppose, you know, a perfect example of that, uh, the fact that they already have this power, was what Steve Higginbotham was talking about, um, where ABI was offering a case of beer to one distributor for, say, $15 and another for $20. Um, it's clearly already within their power and within their profitability model to uh, manipulate the prices uh, so that they get their favorable outcome and their favorable market share. Um, similarly, Carlos Brito, the head of ABI, is on record saying, I mean, um, discussing the, 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 the sort of pricing model that they're looking at, which is to, since he came in, they have raised the prices of their budget brands uh, I forget the number, but they've raised it w to within about 20% of their premiums. That's your regular Budweiser, you know, uh, Miller, what have you. Well, not Miller. Um, and then now their their aim is is in the future to raise the price of the premiums towards their craft and kind of ultra premium brands. So they are manipulating it. Um, were they to gain total control? I think yeah. It, in theory, you know, they they could just say we'll lower the price across the board. Uh, and alcohol is price elastic to about minus 0.35. Uh, so a 10% drop in the price of alcohol, you get 3.5% more consumption on average. Um, but I don't know that they would simply 
do something so simple. I, I would imagine they might drop some prices of some, raise some prices of others. But in any case, it, you know, they would know to in very, very, very fine detail exactly how to manipulate their prices to maximize their profit. Well, you 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 asked about concerns, and uh, our concerns are, uh, and again from a from a law enforcement perspective, um, that low prices and uh, increased accessibility ultimately will uh, saturate communities, will affect the quality of life of those communities. Uh, as we erode away the three-tier system and the Tide House, particularly the Tide House rules, um, we're, we're concerned that uh, the saturation issue, the pre-prohibition uh, circumstances will start to creep back into our society and uh, at some point become acceptable. And uh, we can, we're really concerned about the quality of life of communities as a result of those uh, erosions. Uh, this uh, gentleman right here. Hi, uh, my name is Michael. Um, I just recently graduated from Fordham University up in New York. And sort of going off of what you just said, Mr. Oliver, there's an area, um, for those of you that, that don't know, the primary campus for Fordham is in the Bronx. So it's already a rough neighborhood. Um, but in that particular neighborhood, we have what's called the Tri-Bar. And it's an area where there are literally, it's one corner, and you have three, there, I think there are now actually four bars right there, exactly what you're talking about. But Fordham and the NYPD in that area find it a benefit because it's easier to monitor what goes on particularly in that area rather than dispersing a population where you know you're going to have um, large alcoholism across a greater area, it's all contained. Does that go into any decisions or ideas or processes for you know, what you were just talking about with containment in the future? Or? Well, you know, uh, that's uh, uh, sort of the least of the evils, so to speak, uh, to have them all congregated in one area. But the resources, first of all, the, uh, the victimization that occurs when you have that kind of concentration, I think, is, is expanded. Um, and the resources that the NYPD has to assign to that area is probably extraordinary. I'm sure that the uh, that the leadership, the people who have to make decisions about deployment and how they're going to spend their resources are not necessarily happy about uh, that concentration. And then uh, they're probably not in a position um, to really speak about the impact that's having on, you know, sort of the, the perimeters around those places um, in terms of the saturation. What does it do to uh, young people drinking? Uh, on, uh, people that are, uh, a lot of the illegal activity associated with that, <clears throat> what are the statistics associated with date rapes and uh, assaults and riotous activity um, when you have that kind of concentration? So it's not just about the alcohol, it's the, uh, it's the effects that happen sort of as it exponentially explodes out into other kinds of uh, areas that I spoke about earlier. So my, my thought is that's the sort of the best choice among the evils that you, you have as a, as a police department. My name is Will Harrison from Harrisonburg, Virginia, and I wanted to ask um, a question. In our town, uh, we've had a, a sort of a tradition of when there's been a DUI fatality, it usually results in the, in, in the bar that sold the alcohol to the driver of losing, or actually just end up shutting down. In another case where uh, bars that have had somebody very publicly inebriated have led to their temporary suspension of their driver's license. And I'm, one of the questions for you is, do you, um, have you encountered many mechanisms of liability for the alcohol industry for, uh, you know, public impacts? And also I've, I've heard people talk about how alcohol should have dosage requirements on them, like do not consume more than three in one hour. And, I'm wondering if anybody's uh, heard of that, and I'm also wanted to ask if anybody ever thinks, like when you go to buy Sudafed, they drew your driver's license and say, "I'm sorry, you've already bought two Sudafeds this month. You can't have any more until next month." And whether there's any chance it would ever be dosage restrictions like that for alcohol. Well, I, I'll react to uh, to the technology I had mentioned earlier that there are uh, actually several ways 
that I, that I think that uh, we can be more effective with the proper support from the industry and from uh, political leaders. It's going to take uh, bigger budgets, more technology to do some of the things you're talking about. Uh, in Arizona, where I led the organization, uh, we spent a great deal of our resources on TRACE. There was a program called TRACE where we actually, and when there was a, a really um, bad traffic accident or whatever, and, and speci especially if there was a, a lot of liability associated with it, we spent um, investigative resources tracking back where the, uh, that individual or those individuals last drank. And we held that, per that place responsible for, um, from a legal standpoint, for their contribution to the accident. Um, uh, you know, it's unique kind of legal uh, maneuvering to get that done, but we were able to get it done in some really big cases. But I can tell you that we're, there are many ways to uh, address some of these issues even from an ID standpoint, the technology associated with identifying false IDs, for instance, or that's out there. Um, but the resources to acquire those, um, those that technology um, is, in many cases, not existent, non-existent. There is research uh, that has been done on some of these questions, which pretty much confirms what Mr. Oliver has just said. Uh, Dram shop liability laws in states do motivate restaurant owners and bar owners to be more vigilant about uh, carting people, checking age, and refusing service. What you really need, uh, and research has shown this, that training in and of itself of bar personnel is insufficient. Uh, even house policies are insufficient. You need enforcement. You need the cop coming around and uh, enforcing the laws. You need compliance checks and things like that. <clears throat> Research has shown that the concentration of alcohol out out outlets in uh, a small geographic area like Fordham uh, are um, the, the, the concentration contributes far and away more to the number of alcohol problems than just the amount of alcohol served in and of itself. It just acts as a magnet for people uh, coming together who are doing a lot of things besides just drinking. So uh, when you see what's happened in Boston with their combat zone in the 70s and 80s, you know, when they got rid of the combat zone, a lot of other problems went away. Uh, and uh, We've learned a lot by studying these natural variations in increased availability and reduced availability. We know enough now how to use alcohol regulation to uh, prevent these excessive instances of alcohol problems. Jerry, um, <clears throat> you were talking about uh, last night a specific example in Arizona um, where you were attempting, uh, when you were the alcohol uh, commissioner, attempting to uh, require better training for those who serve alcohol. And then the alcohol industry basically came in and had that rule watered down to some degree. Can you talk about that just because it addresses some of these well, issues? Uh, yeah, interesting. Just uh, one of many uh, interesting uh, dilemmas we were faced with. Um, there was a, um, we wanted to strengthen the training of the, uh, the servers in a number of different uh, venues, including uh, not just liquor stores, but in uh, drug stores that sell, or grocery stores that sell alcohol. I mean, you have sometimes young people that are checking people out uh, that's going through a grocery store and they're selling alcohol to somebody that's underage because they're not even checking the, the license or they're not checking the identification. Um, and so we, uh, we raised that, uh, the requirement that everyone in a particular environment had to be somewhat uh, trained on the liquor laws of the state of Arizona. And it turned out that we had some opposition to that. We wound up uh, settling with having the manager of the, of the store or of the venue trained, and the manager then was responsible, became responsible for making sure that uh, the people underneath them doing a shift or doing a, an, uh, you know, a day's uh, work hours, that they were uh, at least exposed and trained uh, at some level, but it was a minimum level, not the level that we were satisfied with. Um, and again, I had mentioned in my comments earlier that it's really important um, that the industry work 
uh, not only say that they want strong regulation, but that the industry, um, you know, step up in many ways to make sure that that happens. Now, in some cases, and I, I was really impressed with what uh, Steve had to say this morning, Steve Higginbotham had to say from Arkansas, I was really impressed with the things that they were doing in support of. That is not universal. Uh, many times, uh, you know, it's we really want strong regulation, but we're not going to step up to really support that when the director or the, the ABC director step forward to, in, in the budgeting process. We've got just a few more minutes, and I know there are uh, quite a few more questions, so let's do a lightning round here. Please keep your question very short, uh, and we'll take uh, maybe three more if we can, uh, and then answer them all, all at once. Yeah. Since uh, there's such opposition to consolidation, uh, have, have you guys you know, made comments to regulators or legislators uh, individually uh, as a group? Uh, do you plan to make comments as a group? I mean, it's a disparate group, but making similar arguments, uh, conclusions. Okay, next question. Hi, I represent uh, nearly 20,000 on and off-premise uh, beverage licensees, bars, uh, taverns, package stores throughout the country. Um, so a quick comment and then a quick question. Uh, with regard to the industry being involved in public health, um, I guess I see it a little bit differently. I think the industry, and especially my members, are leaders in the, their communities. Uh, with charitable causes and, and civic uh, and organizations, and they play an important role in public safety, which I think goes hand in hand with public health. Uh, they look at more IDs probably every day than your average police officer, and they're, they're the last line of defense against a lot of underage access or other misuse of alcohol. Um, you look at Safe Ride in Wisconsin uh, with regard to what they do uh, and what the Tavern League of Wisconsin provides in terms of Safe Rides Home and preventing drunk driving uh, is just one example. So I, I think that there's a public-private partnership that can exist there and be beneficial. My question, um, and it's, it's based largely on, on what Mr. Baber had to say today, uh, but I, and I directed it to him, but I put it towards the entire group, is can each of you say one positive thing or can you identify one positive thing about the beverage alcohol industry? Um, because there seems to be a lot of sentiment that the industry is doing a lot wrong um, I see it as doing a lot right. I know our members provide uh, 1.5 million jobs, uh, billions in economic activity, wages, taxes, uh, and other benefits. I'm wondering if I can challenge you to say something positive about the industry. Thank you. Great. And, and do we have any, any further questions? All right. Uh, panel, the question's yours. Well, let me just jump in on that, on that issue. Um, I had mentioned it, what the work that the center does. Mm -hmm. And our, our symposiums, and, and I want to, if we have gave the impression that there's nothing positive going on in the industry, that, that's, uh, that's definitely not true. Um, uh, the symposiums that we host are, are, you know, sponsored by the industry, and many times uh, the, they're at the table and coming, helping to come up with solutions or at least uh, examining policies and supporting policies. I think what we're attempting to do here, though, at least from my perspective, is to say that, hey, look, you know, there needs to be more dialogue, there needs to be more thought, you know, really serious thought given to some of the decisions that are being made or some of the, the initiatives that are eroding away some of the, the standards that we've had in the, in the industry for many, many years, I mean, the last 80 years. And that's the point that, uh, you know, I really want to make and want to drive home. Yeah. Um as far as saying things positive or negative about the alcohol industry, um, <clears throat> I don't want to be misinterpreted. Uh, what I say and what we've reported in our book uh, is pretty much what we found when we look at uh, activities, uh, strategies, interventions, policies that the industry has facilitated or, or supported or opposed, and we then look at the evidence. So safe rides programs, uh, something the industry supports. Um, there's no evidence that that has an effect on population rates of alcohol-related traffic accidents. We know, though, that uh, there are a number of policies in the drunk driving area that the industry often opposes that have a direct effect on late-night traffic fatalities. Um, the industry could be very effective, and I think the public health community would support uh, efforts to lower the alcohol content 
of alcoholic beverages. Uh, it happened with distilled spirits uh, when there was a shift to lighter spirits from about an average of 41% down to 38%. That up happened spontaneously. The in industry benefited from it because uh, their tax rates were lower. Uh, and the shift to light beer uh, had some advantages in that respect because light beer had less uh, alcohol in it. <clears throat> That's a simple thing that the industry could be congratulated for if across the board, instead of promoting extreme beers and promoting uh, Mike's hard lemonade and, and uh, uh, beverages that are targeted at young people with higher alcohol content for the specific purpose of having higher alcohol content, uh, if they tried something different, I think they would be applauded. So we've got to talk about the uh, evidence that supports policies, and if it doesn't support the policies that the industry uh, supports, that's their problem, not the, the people who are evaluating the evidence. I, I would just add that uh, the focus of, our, of, our, of Tim's piece in the Washington Monthly, and I think the general focus of the, of the consolidation uh, issues that, that New America has focused on, is not on the individual proprietorships and and uh, retail outlets that you know th there's much that we can talk about there but uh, but on the producers of of beer and and, and alcohol and uh, in a sense their control of your members um, they're dictating the market in which you have to operate um, their manipulation of the rules under which you have to operate and um, you know, if, if anything, the end result of um, a, a, a strengthened three-tier system and a, a, and a system in which local communities and, and health, of, health professionals and state legislatures can make decisions about what's best and not best for their community, would, I would think, over the long haul, strengthen the hand of, of the retail sector. Um, uh, and so... so uh, 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 anyway, I just wanted, wanted to point that out. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for coming. Oh, well, I, I think that goes actually t t to your question, right? The, 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 um, the, the beef here is, is with consolidation. Um, uh, but but, but if, if there's others who, who might want to be able to... Sure. I mean, I guess just to, to address your question... I think what we've done here today is speak to legislatures. You know, there's a reason that we put this article in the Washington Monthly and the reason that we're hosting this event uh, here. Uh, I imagine that we have, if not spoken directly to legislators, we've spoken to people who deal with them directly. So hopefully they've heard. Um, to go with the other one, uh, to say something positive uh, about the beverage industry, uh, I mean, I think everything that you said uh, is accurate, is true. Those are positives. Um, particularly on the entrepreneurial aspect of it. That said, uh, absolutely nothing about enforcing the three-tier laws further uh, would do anything to reduce those positive impacts. So I don't know that they're connected questions. All right. With that, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank the New America Foundation and thank our panel. Thanks.